Beth felt better than she had in a long time. She had a short night, but John was hospitable, and the bacon and coffee she had just had for breakfast was delicious. Now she leaned back on the sofa and relaxed. It was her third day at John's, and everything was going well. John's phone then started beeping as if he was receiving text messages. He beeped it a few times, and Beth thought it might be important. Beth took the phone off the charger and opened it. John didn't have a password on it. He said he had nothing to hide. Beth looked through text messages, and there were a few new ones from Cindy, John's wife, who was in Mexico doing a ministry project for their church. The first message was, Carol told me you're sleeping with some bitch. You bastard. So, how do you like it when the shoe is on the other foot? The others were photographs of a woman she assumed was Cindy, although they had never met. In the photographs, Cindy had sex with two men at once. Just at that moment, the doorbell rang. Beth opened it and saw a woman in a dress and a police officer in uniform. They squeezed inside. The woman said, I'm from CPS. We are taking you from this home for your own safety and placing you in a temporary foster home. Beth started to back away, but the policeman and the woman from the criminal investigation department grabbed her by the arms and pulled her towards the door. Beth resisted, but they continued to drag her. John then ran out of the bedroom, shouting, Let her go! What the hell are you doing? As he rushed to the scene of the fight, a police officer hit him with a stun gun. Beth kept screaming, but finally managed to shout out, CPS can't pick me up. I'm an adult. Let me go. The CPS lady looked shocked, and the officer let Beth go. With one hand free, Beth punched the CPS woman square in the nose. She then turned to the policeman and asked, Why are you trying to kidnap me? John came to his senses from the stun gun. He jumped up and rushed at the policeman, knocking him to the floor. The policeman managed to grab his gun and shoot, hitting John in the shoulder. That's when two more police officers burst into the house and handcuffed John and Beth. Beth said, These people tried to kidnap me. That CPS bitch said she would take me into foster care. I'm an adult. I think they were going to sell me. John tried to help, but another cop shot him. John said, I need an ambulance, right now. An ambulance was called when police outside heard a gunshot and arrived a couple of minutes later. The paramedic took one look at the situation and shouted, What the hell? What kind of idiot cuffed this man's hands behind his back while he was shot in the shoulder? Don't they have an IQ test for cops? Remove the handcuffs, now! One of the cops turned John over onto his sore shoulder to remove the handcuffs. John screamed in pain. Beth screamed, Stop hurting him. My mother is a lawyer, and she will make you all pay. Why did you even burst in here? CPS? I'm an adult. The woman standing by the door grinned. I called them. I saw what happened here while this man's wife was serving the Lord. Beth told John, Find out her name. Two more policemen entered the house, this time in plain clothes. One of them said, What's going on here? Beth said, Those two tried to kidnap me, and when my father tried to help, he shot him. I want them arrested. The policeman said, Take her handcuffs off. He turned to the CPS lady he recognized. Why are you here? We got a call that a child was in danger and a man was threatening her with a gun, so we came to pick her up, and then all hell broke loose. Beth screamed, I'm an adult, you idiot, and this is my dad. Paramedics wheeled John out on a stretcher. Beth ran up to him. Will he be okay? He should be fine in a few days. Officers, can she go with him in the ambulance? The guys in civilian clothes said yes at the same time. Then they told everyone to sit down. One went out the door and caught a woman retreating across the street. He brought it back and took statements from everyone. A day later, John and Beth were in a hospital room talking to a man in a suit. He said, I have copies of all statements. The CPS lady is in the process of being fired. The police officer who shot you has been suspended pending an investigation. The woman, Carol, admitted that she called them without really knowing what was going on. Perhaps she will be accused of something, but we are not sure what exactly. Beth looked very serious and hugged John. She did something else, Dad. She told Cindy that you were sleeping with some bitch. I was just looking at your phone before all this happened. I'm so sorry, Dad. John looked at the photographs, and tears began to flow. Well, that's it then. 
do some paperwork. As you know, I have a solid prenuptial agreement. Let her be served at the airport when she lands on Friday. If you can, get a restraining order. There's no way out of this. Also, find out who we can sue and do so. For starters, Carol slandered me and Beth. Jim, a lawyer, said, Oh, it's already in development. We're suing her. The CPS woman. The cop who shot you. CPS and the police department. We're also suing the cops who handcuffed you too. The paramedic is dying to witness this. Was your security system turned on? John smiled. Certainly. All this is in the cloud. I need to take painkillers and rest. Thanks, Jim. A few hours later, Valerie, John's personal secretary, arrived to update him on business matters. Don't worry, John. I've contacted the project managers and we'll sort everything out until you can get back to work. Today we received final permits for the Ironwood project, so we will begin construction of the model homes. Abe says we could be ready to start selling in 10 weeks. I'm already drawing up a schedule for trading. You must create a package for this unit. There should be big bonuses for everyone. Abe says if you don't agree, I should hit you on the shoulder. By the way, I may need help soon. We currently have four units operating and two more are awaiting permits. I was sorry to hear about Cindy. Gee, thanks, Valerie. You always know what to say to cheer me up. Well, I may be getting a divorce, but at least I'm not poor. We have an adultery clause in our prenuptial agreement, and it's important. I'll have to send Jim a box of steaks. Maybe when things calm down, my daughter Beth will want to be your assistant. Okay, boss. I'll take care of it. I need to get back to the office. Get well. Three days later, Cindy stepped off the plane and headed to baggage claim. When she got there, two men approached her. Hello, Jim. I guess my cheating husband didn't want to face me. What a coward. I don't believe in divorce, but I'm not sure our marriage can survive this. Jim handed her a large envelope. Well, I'm sure it's impossible, Mrs. Cork. You've been served. The second man was filming a video. Jim continued, Besides, there is a restraining order in the envelope. You cannot come within 500 feet of your house or John. Copies of the photographs you kindly sent are in the envelope. John files a complaint under the article Adultery. There is also a letter from John. The marriage contract will be respected 100%. As Jim left, Cindy shouted, He can't do this! He cheated first! Jim simply turned and said, Read the letter and do not violate the restraining order. Otherwise you will end up in jail. Cindy was shocked. She collected her luggage and took advantage of the free shuttle to a nearby Hilton hotel. When she tried to rent a room, none of her cards worked. Finally, she successfully used her debit card. She then went to her room, grabbed some booze from the mini-fridge, and sat down to read the letter. Cindy, I'm guessing you were shocked that you were served at the airport. You should have expected this. After all, you actually cheated on me with two men at the same time, and then sent me photos. Beth showed them to me when I was in the hospital after a gunshot wound. I hope to be home by the time you read this, but I don't know for sure. Beth was a little bruised, but otherwise okay. Apart from this divorce suit, many other people are having problems. Lives are ruined, and it's all because of you and your smug friend Carol. Not only did Carol tell you that I was cheating, which, by the way, I wasn't, she also called CPS on Beth, which resulted in me being tased and injured and many careers being ruined. We're suing her, just so you know, along with the idiot from CPS, the cop who shot me, and several others, including the two men you were with. By this time, Cindy was crying and practically in shock. She read on. I think I should introduce Beth. You may remember when we met, I told you that my last girlfriend, Marcia, dumped me in a very public and disgusting way. Turns out, because of this, she couldn't come to me and tell me she was pregnant. So I ended up having a daughter I never knew I had. Beth, my daughter, finally convinced her mother to tell her who her father was. A few days after you left, she knocked on my door. I was so happy to know about her. We were going to wait until you got back to talk about it, because these are things that need to be dealt with face to face. I know you would like Beth. Then your friend Carol thought I was having an affair with my daughter and sent you a couple of photos of Beth and I hugging. Carol took these photos through our windows, so she too was accused of being a peeping Tom. Anyway, on the advice of my lawyer, I paid off and canceled all of our credit cards. 
I left $2,500 in the checking account because it was in the prenuptial agreement. Oh, and you're spreading poison. I talked to the pastor when he visited me here in the hospital. He recognized the two men in the photographs. I think their return home was not quite what they hoped for. Spouses simply don't understand these things. Both wives filed for divorce, and you provided evidence to support their claims. So many lives have been ruined by you. I hope you guys did a lot of good on this trip because you left massive destruction here. I expect that the next time we will meet in court. Your mother has your car and she knows what's going on. She was a little shocked by the photos, but agreed to host you if you needed somewhere to stay. At least, we don't have children. However, the guys you had sex with have children, and now they will only see their children during court-authorized visitation. If you decide to return to our church, you will probably find it very cold. By my count, you and Carol have ruined the lives of at least a dozen different people. Have a good day, John. Cindy let out a primal scream and collapsed on the floor, sobbing. The people in the next room called the front desk. A couple of minutes later, there was a knock on the door. When she did not answer, the manager used the universal key card to enter the room. She sat down on the floor and hugged Cindy, saying quietly, What's the matter, honey? Tell me what's going on. The letter lay on the floor next to Cindy. She handed it to the manager. She held Cindy in her arms and read the letter. Oh dear, I read about it in the newspaper. It looks like things are only going to get worse. Let's put you on the bed. Tonight I will clean your room and send you some food. You need to eat. I will also have someone check on you a few times. Get some rest. She locked the mini fridge when she left. She didn't want to let Cindy get drunk. John was discharged on Saturday morning and returned home in a rented hospital wheelchair. They left him in the living room. He had a cast on his arm and shoulder that was supposed to stay there for a while. Beth took care of him and was joined by her mother. Mom explained how a month later she realized that leaving him was a huge mistake and had regretted it ever since. She had never been married, and Beth said she rarely dated. She and John were catching up. At about 3 p.m., the doorbell rang. Beth opened it. It was an elderly woman. Can I help you? The woman said. Please don't shoot the messenger. I'm Cindy's mom. She wanted to come herself, but she has a restraining order. Can I come in? John said to let her in. When she entered, John asked, How are you doing, Mom? You know I've always liked you. I'm sorry this came between us. Thanks for stopping by. Jean smiled. I was afraid that you would shoot me. I'm glad you don't hate me. How are you doing and could you introduce me? John smiled back. I don't hate you, Jin. This is my daughter Beth and her mother, Marcia. Everything is moving for the better for me. My shoulder hurts, but I have pills. Physically, I'm fine. Psychologically, not very well. Jean turned to Beth and Marcia. Thank you for helping him. This is a difficult time for everyone. Cindy is a real wreck. Although Carol started this disaster, Cindy realizes that most of the damage lies with her. She has no excuse for what she did. She really doesn't understand it herself. I can't even imagine what she was thinking. Marcia said, I am a family law lawyer. I see things like this too often. It's never a logical or reasonable explanation. If people were always logical and reasonable, such things would never happen. My colleague calls this an instant idiot attack. Such a person always feels terrible afterwards, but usually by then, it is too late. Many times marriages seem great until an explosion occurs. Then there was nothing left but a fireball. It happens so quickly and without warning that there is no time to stop it. John was sleeping, and then, boom, the cops, the CPS people, the injury, and the photos. His world exploded in a matter of seconds. He didn't stand a chance. I understand, and so does my daughter. She received a text from her friend and made a split-second, terrible decision. At that moment, she was controlled by anger. Anyway, I just stopped by to pick up some of her things, can I? Marcia stood up. Beth, stay with John. I'll help Jean. John, can she take advantage of your suitcases? Of course. They are on the top shelf in the dressing room. As soon as they got upstairs, John asked, Beth, what happened to your mom? She acted like she was in love with me, but still left me. Plus, she did it screaming in public, calling me all kinds of disgusting names. Now she's so cute. 
Is she planning on trying to break my heart again? Given the current situation, I'm a little afraid to tell you. Okay, but I can't trust her. Maybe she should leave then. Beth began to pace around the room. A couple of times she started to say something but then fell silent. Finally, she stopped by the bed. Fine. Her roommate saw you with another woman. Mom got mad and yelled at you. After that, you tried to call her a couple of times, but she didn't answer your calls. A couple of weeks later, she and her roommate were walking, and the roommate pointed out the woman she thought you were cheating on your mom with. Mom recognized this woman. It was your sister. Mom tried to call you that night, but the number was no longer in service. A couple of days later, she came over to your house, and the neighbor told her that you dropped out of school, transferred, and moved out. Where? She didn't know. So, it was exactly the same as now. She heard that I was cheating and blew my world up without bothering to check. Great. How did I get lucky enough to connect with two such women? I'm sorry, Dad. It wasn't quite the same, though. No revenge sex. In fact, my mother told me that she had never been with anyone else at all. Neither before nor after her hysterics. You're the only guy she's ever been with. And yes, she still loves you. John was speechless. A few minutes later, Marcia and Jean came downstairs with three suitcases and a trash bag. Marcia said, Her clothes are in suitcases and her things, such as shampoo and cosmetics, are in her bag. This is fine? John waved his hand towards the door. After Marcia helped Jean dive in, she returned. I should probably leave. I just wanted to check on Beth. Okay, let's look at you a little too. John took her hand. Why do you practice family law? It seems like a sad specialty. Well... I've made a few mistakes myself, and every now and then I get a chance to help someone avoid similar mistakes. So you're here to stop me from making a mistake? Unfortunately, no. I'm only here to help as you're still recovering. Plus, some lady across the street said you were having an affair with my daughter. Secondly, in order for me to help, I should have been with your wife a week or so ago. Alas, I was not there, and she went too far. If all she did was make a complete fool of herself by yelling at an innocent person in a public place, perhaps I could do something to help her. Interesting comparison. Could you explain more? You know exactly what I'm talking about. They told me that you are cheating on me. I'm sure you remember how I left you. You tried to call, but I didn't answer. Then I found out that this woman was your sister. Then I already tried to call to apologize but your number no longer worked. I went to your house, but you were no longer there. I regret it every day since then. Now I can finally say how sorry I am. Okay, that makes sense. If you thought I was having an affair with my sister, I understand why you might imagine I was having an affair with Beth. Please don't laugh at me. In case Beth didn't tell you, I never stopped loving you. Once again, I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. You are married. John was smiling now. Not for long. Cindy has already been served, so we are legally separated, as you probably know. Beth also said that you haven't been with anyone for a long time. Maybe we can fix this when my divorce is final and if we're both still interested. Marcia was smiling now. If my dear daughter told you this, she probably also said that I have never had sex with anyone but you. If you ever need me, I'm always at your service. Besides, since I have been faithful to you all these years, you probably understand that I will never cheat on you in the future. Enough of this, Beth said. John needs to take a few pills and go to bed. Mom, you will help until John gets better. Help him get settled and I'll see you in the morning. The next morning, John and Marcia were talking. Marcia told him, I lost touch when you transferred to another school, but I never forgot what I did with a wonderful guy. I've always wondered where you are. I thought that if I found you and apologized, maybe you would forgive me. After I graduated from law school and started working, I told my story to my senior partner. He said he would help and assign the detective our firm used to track you down. The detective found you without any problems. He also found out that you were married. My senior partner had a friend from law school with a firm in your area. He got me a job here. I've been working at a firm a few miles away ever since. I became a partner several years ago. From time to time, I managed to catch a glimpse of you. I didn't want to hurt you more, so I never contacted you. 
When Beth turned 18, I finally relented and told her who you were. This really hurt you again. It turns out I'm being stupid all the time. I'm sorry your life, John interrupted her. Well, my Uncle Jim Pearson doesn't think so. He told me that he faced you in court seven times and only managed to win once. He's pretty smart, so if you almost always win, you can't be stupid. Yes, Jim Pearson is a good lawyer, but the times I have encountered him, he has not been on the right side of a divorce. I didn't know he was your uncle. I'm a pretty good lawyer. Where I get stupid is in everything related to you. A week later, Marsha was in her office when she received a call. Cindy Cork is here. She wants to see you. She doesn't have an appointment. Show her out. The assistant led Cindy inside, closing the door behind them. She showed Cindy to a chair by the table and sat down on the sofa. Cindy said, Thank you for having me. Why are you here, Mrs. Cork? I need your help. People tell me that you are the best at reconciliation. I was really stupid and I really don't think I have any chance, but I don't want to lose my husband. Do you know who I am? Yes, you are Marsha Campbell. I talked to some people where I work and they said that you are the best divorce lawyer in town and you also try to get people to reconcile whenever possible. Well, Mrs. Cork, it's all true. I think I'm the best. However, your study missed one important point. I'm also Beth's mom. Cindy lost consciousness and slowly slid to the floor. When she came to, her head was lying on Marsha's lap, and Joan, the assistant, was wiping her face with a cold, damp cloth. Marsha smiled at her. Welcome back, Cindy. I think you were tired, so you fell asleep for a few minutes. I don't usually have that kind of influence on people. There is ice in this rag. Let us take a little care of you. Would you like some water? There was a straw in the bottle, and Cindy took a couple sips. Why are you so kind to me? When you said you were Beth's mom, I panicked. Thank you. Joan chuckled slightly. Yes, usually. When people lose consciousness, we undress them and leave them in an alley. Marcia decided to make an exception for you. You're very pretty, so we can sell you to a Colombian brothel. Marcia covered Joan's mouth with her hand. Joan, stop it. Sorry, Cindy. Joan has a very strange sense of humor, but is usually quite nice. We undid a couple of buttons and a belt. But why such a shock? My face usually makes people choke rather than faint. I just know what you must be thinking about me. I'm usually not as stupid and terrible as I was just a short time ago. I lost my husband and hurt a lot of people. Deep down, I know I can't bring John back, but I want to somehow make things right and maybe be friends. I've hurt a lot of people. I think I can get up now. Fine, sit back in your chair. I need to call. Marsha took out her cell phone and pressed the speed dial button. Beth, how's John? Okay, give him the phone. John, how are you? Well, take a pill, you'll need it. I need to ask you something. I'm here with Cindy. She came to my office not knowing that I was Beth's mother. Either way, she's accepted that you won't take her back. But I want you to remain friends. You like her mother. I heard you call her mom. You have a story. Cindy is not dangerous. Please call your uncle and ask for the ban to be lifted. It is not necessary. Please. Beg. Okay, thank you. I invited her to dinner. See you soon. You're coming to dinner tonight, aren't you, Cindy? Um, I guess. Okay. At seven. You can meet Beth. Meanwhile, John stared at the phone as if it was about to turn into a snake. What the heck? Marsha and Cindy are now friends, and she invited Cindy to dinner. I think I'm in big trouble. Do you know that conceived your mother? I think she wants to make sure it's really over with you and Cindy before Mom tries to move in with you. Mom actually has morals. Otherwise, she would have tried to do this years ago. Fine. Cindy and I are definitely over it, and it's not just about sex. She freaked out and went crazy over the message and didn't even try to check if it was true. Essentially, in our relationship, she took her neighbor's word for it. I would spend the rest of my life wondering when it would happen again. Obviously, she had no trust or respect for me. Tell me how this is different from what Marshall did. Okay, so your mom didn't sleep with two guys in retaliation, but she broke up by yelling at me in an obviously public place because a friend said she saw me with another woman. 
She was ready to leave me without any evidence at all and to do it through public humiliation. Again, no trust and no respect. I understand your point of view, but let me ask you this. If your mom came to you a few days after her mistake, would you take her back? Yes, her mistake was similar, but her reaction was much less crazy. Many couples quarrel, break up, and soon make up. This kind of thing is quite common when people date, and often occurs due to misunderstandings. Doing what Cindy did, and doing it after 14 years of marriage is not the same thing. John thought about it. Okay, it's true. Despite the similarities, what Cindy did was unforgivable. To answer the question, yes. If Marcia had found me a week later, explained what happened, and apologized, we would have made up. Hey, I loved her. It took me a couple of years to start dating again. I need another pill. Beth gave him another pain pill, and he fell asleep. Marcia returned home around 5 p.m., and John woke up when she kissed him. He woke up when their lips touched, smiled, and said, This is violence. I am unable to resist my condition. Marcia just smiled. Well, I'm a lawyer. Sue me. So, why did you invite Cindy to dinner and make me cancel the party? Are you trying to get us back together? Whether you get back together or not depends only on the two of you. I have no right to my own opinion. I invited her because you two haven't spoken since all this happened. All this happened because there was no conversation. Her friend sent her several messages accusing her, and she acted without talking to you about it. A simple conversation, and all of this could have been avoided. I know Jim Pearson is a divorce lawyer, but if you were my client, I would insist that you meet face to face. The breakdown in almost every love story begins with either a lack of communication or misunderstanding. John didn't say anything. Cindy arrived at about ten minutes to seven. She didn't knock. She simply walked in and walked towards John. Beth intercepted her. Why didn't you knock and don't even try to touch him? Cindy stopped and said, John, can I talk to you alone? I'm really sorry. John shook his head. No. You cheated with two men, caused the breakup of three families, and left five children with visiting fathers. Because of your good friend Carol, my daughter was beaten and handcuffed. I was hit with a stun gun, wounded and handcuffed. There's no way I'm going to be alone with you. In addition, the house belongs to me under the marriage contract. And Beth is right. You should have knocked. Tomorrow I'll pay for the locks to be changed. Marcia entered the room. It looks like everything is going well so far. How are you, Cindy? Joan asked me to say hi. Thank you for inviting me, Marcia. Tell Joan for me that she is a cruel person. But I'm sure you know that. I'm not trying to hurt John. John practically shouted, You already did it! I know. I just mean I try not to do it anymore. I was stupid. I don't know why I did what I did. I went to Mexico to do God's work, but instead, I did the devil's work. I'm not trying to force you to take me back. What I did was unforgivable. I just hope you don't hate me. If you need a housekeeper or a cook or anything else, or a nurse while you recover, I would be glad to do it as a kind of penance. I already went to church last Sunday. I publicly apologized for the terrible mess I made. Maybe I'll write a book, How to Ruin Your Life in Ten Minutes. What does ten minutes mean? asked Beth. I'm a virgin, but I think sex should take longer. That's true, but we definitely didn't have sex. I just asked them to pose with me so I could get the photos. I'm so sorry I did this. I explained this to both wives. They both slapped me. I don't blame them. I don't know if my words have any meaning to them. There was silence for a few seconds. John then said, It may matter to them because they found out about it by accident. However, for me, it doesn't matter much. Yes, it is unbearable for me that you cheated. And it is cheating if you are naked and two naked men penetrate you, even if it was only for a moment. It was terrible to find out that my wife was cheating on me. But what was even worse was that you deliberately hurt me as much as you could without even giving me a chance to defend myself. You received a message from someone that I'm cheating on you. Instead of contacting me, you sent me photographic evidence of your infidelity with two men at once. This is very different from someone trying to hide an affair and getting caught. Yes, an affair is 
of course, cheating. But at the same time, they are not trying to hurt their spouse, but are trying to hide it. Putting it out there like you did means you didn't want to be married anymore. Obviously, no self-respecting man will put up with this and take you back. Either you wanted out of the marriage and did what you needed to do to make it happen, or you have so little respect for me that you thought I would accept this situation. I assure you that if someone told me that you were cheating, I would either confront you or look for real evidence. Maybe I'd hire a private investigator. Besides, we've been married for quite a long time. I doubt I would even believe it without real evidence. I loved you. I trusted you. You didn't feel the same. Now I know that I can never trust you with my heart again. I understand. I don't know what came over me to behave like this. Since I don't know why I did it, how can I promise that it will never happen again? Before I went on this journey, no one could have convinced me that I would ever behave this way. It's like I don't know myself. John thought for a moment. So, what are you going to do now? As you know, the prenuptial agreement states that the cheating spouse leaves the marriage with whatever he contributed, which in your case was $2,500. You will need to get a job. Any prospects? Cindy shook her head. No. You know that I almost have a higher education, where I specialized in psychology. I should have seen a psychologist instead of trying to become one. John laughed. I know, right? Freshman female psychology majors are practically a cliché. Hey, at least you don't have to worry about some previous employer giving you a bad recommendation. Maybe the pastor will write you a recommendation, although unlikely. You also know that I have never worked. I have no idea what kind of job I can get. That's why I mentioned that I would be your housekeeper and cook. I have experience in this position. However, I may not be able to get a good reference from my former employer. I ruined my career. Yes, it looks like a whirlpool, but I know your former employer. He's not a bad guy. Maybe he can help. John, you have absolutely no reason to help me. I didn't just burn this bridge. I blew it up. Let me think about it and we'll talk after dinner. Marsha and Beth went all out for dinner. They ordered pizza and wings. Everyone ate on trays in the living room so they could be close to John. As soon as they had eaten, John said, Okay, Cindy, here's what I'll do as long as Uncle Jim and Marsha say it won't ruin my business. You know that I built and own a large apartment complex on Lincoln Avenue. There are always free apartments there. I'll arrange for you to live there for free. Then we'll find a job for you. Marsha interrupted him. John, you don't want to annul the prenuptial agreement, so we will need to sign and file a divorce petition before you do anything. I already signed the papers and gave them to Jim, Cindy said. Marsha smiled. Okay. I will also draw up a document in which you will forever renounce any future claims to anything from John in exchange for a lump sum payment of $5,000. Is this okay, John? Certainly. Perhaps there are too many lawyers in my life. Now they are spending my money. Marsha smiled. They continued chatting for another hour before Cindy went to see her mom. Marsha told her that a document in which Cindy renounced any claim to John's assets would be ready in a couple of days. She asked Cindy which lawyer she should send it to. I don't have a lawyer. I don't have the money for this. And I don't think I need lawyers. I'm not disputing anything. So I just signed the papers in front of the notary at Uncle Jim's office. When the document is ready... Just let me know and I will come to your office and sign it. Marcia shook her head. This is not a good idea. I have a clear conflict of interest. There are two companies in my building. Tim, a senior partner at another firm, owes me some favors. I will ask him to review the document I am preparing and also to get a copy of the divorce papers from Jim. Jim is a good guy, and so is John, so I'm sure the divorce papers are in order but someone needs to review them on your behalf. I'll call you tomorrow and give you the phone number after I make arrangements with Tim. As soon as Cindy left, Marsha said, I hate to admit it, but I like her. Yes, she was an idiot for a while, but she's not a bad person. You have good taste in women. John laughed out loud. Certainly. Well, except for the part where they lose their temper when they think I'm cheating. I know, John. I did almost the same thing, except for the sex part. 
You still love her, don't you? John looked sad. Certainly. I've loved her for many years. But I can't stay married to her. I'm not going to stop the divorce. Are you going to get her a job? It could be in one of your companies or with someone who owes you something. There is also a housekeeper cook position. On a completely unrelated note, do you think you could ever forgive me and love me again, even though I'm a terrible housewife and an even worse cook? I don't think I ever stopped loving you. It's a defeat or a victory for me, but in any case, I will get a wonderful daughter from this deal. Marcia looked thoughtful. I'm going to shock and insult the man I love. I love you. She loves you, and you love us both. How would you feel if you and I, say, got married? Then, with my full blessing, Cindy could be your girlfriend. Beth practically screamed. Marcia, what did you do to my mom? My whole life is a lie. Marcia hugged Beth. I don't think you like this idea. I'm really sorry. No, the idea is brilliant. I'm just shocked that you suggested this, although I'm not sure John and Cindy would go for it. Well, John is a man, so it all depends on what kind of head he uses. John shook his head. Well, Marcia, when you think outside the box, you really, really think outside the box. Why? Cindy came to my office because she heard that I was the best family law lawyer in the area when it came to reconciliation. I am proud of this. In this case, the obvious stumbling block to you guys getting back together is my reluctance to break up with you now that I'm sort of back. That's all I could come up with. I invited Cindy over tonight to see if we could get along because it wouldn't work if she and I were at odds. Turns out I like her, and I think she even likes me. Wouldn't this be a win for everyone? Do you think you can handle two women? Beth, if I've learned anything lately, it's that I can't handle even one woman, let alone two. I can already imagine how they make the schedule. You might as well stick a fork in me. I'm over it. Marcia leaned down and planted a passionate kiss on his lips. I'm going to call Cindy and tell her to come back. We should probably ask her everything. Cindy returned about 40 minutes later. She just sat down on the sofa and said, Okay, why did I have to go back? I'll take it upon myself, Beth said. My mom has an offer. You originally approached her because of her reputation as a conciliator. Well, she came up with one option. So far, you two seem to like each other. You're both in love with Dad, and even though you've both heard him at different times, he still loves you both. Mom suggested that she marry Dad and you could be the side chick. What do you think? This is the best offer you can get. Cindy began to cry, and soon it all turned into sobs. Marcia and Beth sat on either side of her and held her. It took her a while to calm down. If John agrees, then I'm definitely fine. It's much better than losing it completely. We may need a calendar, John groaned. See, Beth... I told you so. I'm dead. A few months later, the divorce was final. John and Marcia did not marry, but she and Beth moved in with John. John got the house across the street where Carol lived during the trial. All other lawsuits were settled for undisclosed amounts. Cindy moved into Carol's old house across the street as soon as John ordered his crews to renovate it. Cindy actually worked for John as a housekeeper, cook, and Marcia and Cindy worked out a schedule of sorts. It turns out that neither Marcia nor Cindy liked girl-on-girl -girl sex, but they both liked threesomes. So in the end, it was a win-win for all three of them. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.